back in history. Um, if, you, if anybody does like Sargent, he was highly dependent on British portraiture and tradition. So Sir Joshua Reynolds, Gainsborough, um, a lot of those artists for you know, especially painting. Um, and that's generally what I'm thinking in terms of this uh, painting. Uh, for people that are drawing the figure, um, a living artist, again, Jerome Witkin is probably my favorite living figurative artist. Uh, I think the drawings and the figurative compositions that he comes up with, especially for some of their social and political uh, relevance or idea behind them are just phenomenal. Um, so, but I think a, a great way to, to kind of follow up on that is just go to as many museums as possible. Uh, I think that's the best way to discover stuff. If somebody catches your eye, um, you know, get the get a book, do research, and just follow them. Uh, that's what I'd always do: is follow their not not what they're doing presently, but what led to them. Um, you know, you can always trace the artists and then the genealogy of their their interest and practice. You know, back through history infinitely. So hopefully that gives you a few. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, we actually have an interesting question from Maloney. Um, or Malone, uh, do you have a microphone, by the way, Malone? Um, if you can hear me, I'm going to basically activate your mic. So, hello, Malone. Malone, are you there? Okay, I don't know if he has a mic, but I, I'm going to ask the question on his behalf, and please excuse me, my Latin is not that good. So, um, basically he asks, how would you box up the upper and lower torso and the rear? Can a single muscle ever be shown both squashing and stretching? And please explain the latissimus dorsi and the teres major interaction and connection to the arm. Thanks. Um, okay, well, let me start. For boxing out the, the rib cage and the pelvis uh, from the back, I use the, the landmarks um, for the back of the rib cage, um, the, the end or the, um, the bottom two ribs generally will present a similar shape to the front in that it's uh, much like the peace sign and the egg that I talked about in the lecture, um, but that peace sign or that triangle at the bottom will be much more um, collapsed. Um, I use those two points as the back plane proper, uh, the two points that would give me a surface that define the back. Um, the corner or the border of one of those points would give the side plane and I'll take the height of that to roughly about the point of the top of the scapula, uh, and that's where the height of the box will exist. The big difference for the back of the rib cage will be that as a box you'll see on top of it, uh, whereas from the front you'll see underneath it, and that's to set up a logical recording of the perspective travels of the spine. The pelvis from the back I'll use the sacrum, uh, that triangle that doesn't really get covered efficiently in the lecture because of time, uh, and we only did the front. But I'll use the sacrum uh, as the landmark point and extend the plane or the points of landmark just a little bit beyond it to set up the back. Uh, and then from that point, you'll get the side. And then I always make sure that from the pelvis, uh, from the back view of the pelvis, um, I'll show underneath that perspective as it has to be the complement to what's in the front, which is the top view of the box uh, of the pelvis from the front. So that's a, that was the first part. What was the second part of the question? Well, the second part of the question was, uh, can a single muscle ever be shown both squash, squashing and stretching? No. Can a single uh, muscle ever be shown? I, I, um, I would imagine, I, it's hard to think of an example. Maybe, um, maybe your tensor fascia on the leg, if you are bending your leg, um, but, your mus but your leg is abducted, I guess technically it could be squashed and pinched at the same time, um, but that would, I think, what would have to be required is a competing um, eminence, like the, you know, the leg pushing up against the iliac crest causing for the muscle to, to pinch while it's possibly stretched. Um, but can you ever have a muscle that's stretched and pinched at the same time? Um, I would say no, although there's degrees of stretch and pinch. Okay, and the last part was, uh, please explain the latissimus dorsi and teres major interaction and connection to the arm, which I think you probably uh, covered. So yeah, um, that's just going to take, I would get out an anatomy book and really go through the connections. Um, the latissimus is you know, that really important adductor uh, of the arm on the back. 
which is uh, covering a lot of the, the information anatomically on the back and then going to the, the humerus. And then the teres major, uh, that really important hero muscle of the scapula that I commonly, commonly see people leave out all the time. Um, so that larger shape moving from the scapula to the humerus, uh, really complex interaction. And I feel more comfortable actually using images to, to define and, and really do a, a good job. Otherwise, I think I would just be you know, misleading and confusing. Okay. So I'm going to have to defer to a later anatomy lecture. No problem. Apologies. <laughs> Um, our next question is from Marco. Marco, do you have a microphone by any chance? Uh, you didn't give me a response. Uh, so if you're there, I'm going to activate your, your mic. Hello, Marco. Marco, are you there? Okay, I'm assuming he doesn't. So I'll just read what he, he wrote. He says, hi, Michael, great workshop and book. Both have been very helpful. Uh, my question is, when drawing from life, is it important to draw details like wrinkles, hair, etc., or should you just stick to drawing the structure? Um, I, I would say they're both important, mm -hmm. but I would never move to the particular before really working out the general. Um, and I think that the only danger in moving to the wrinkles and the... Um, you know, the features and the hair, right off the bat is that it, when you're prioritizing your drawing, which is really you know, your thought process, it doesn't allow enough um, to be understood to service it and support it. Um, it'd be like if I you know, wrote a paper or gave a presentation and didn't talk about what my main you know, interests were and just started to give you facts and details. Um, so you know, always, you know, I think about it in comparison to language or writing or, or speaking. Um, so, of course, they're absolutely important. It's part of the thing that gives us, you know, a lot of, of life and expressive quality to the figures um, in what I would imagine is a harder thing to relate to being the structure is. And it's just not something that we relate to and see uh, like boxes and cylinders. I mean, it's abstract. It's highly abstract. Um, and that's one of the things I always try to emphasize in, in my students' work is that it's actually a very abstract process to draw representationally. Um, and I think that you know, abstract art is probably much more representational than we give it credit for. Um, so I think that absolutely important, but it has its place and it should be, you know, depending on where you're at with your drawing, it may be subordinate to larger issues at this time. Okay, and I think actually we've reached our, uh, our end point. Um, for this particular live Q&A. So I'd like to thank everyone who attended today's live Q&A with Michael Hampton. And a special thanks to Michael for giving us a, a portion of his time today to answer our questions um, in this live Q&A. So Michael, thank you so much for participating and, and helping us out with this. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for having me and for everybody that, you know, that took the workshop. I want to thank you all for um, checking it out. Awesome. And again, to everyone, thank you for attending. For those of you who haven't checked the other workshops out, we still have a, uh, uh, other ones online that you can, you can buy and, 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 and look at as well. Um, so please check out the site also and look for this live Q&A to be uploaded sometime this week. Um, we also have uh, an issue with Peter's live Q&A. For those of you who are still waiting for that, we're trying to resolve what was going on with the actual file, but we're trying to get it up as soon as possible. Um, beyond that, uh, this one should be up this week as well. Um, and again, thank you all for attending, and this concludes today's live Q&A. Thank you very much. Bye.